What's going on, world? Welcome to another edition of the Black Mental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Reg. Joined today with me is another very, very, very special guest. I've been, we've been trying to make this, this interview happen for a minute, but schedule <laughs> conflicts between me and him. He busy, I'm busy, but we finally have it. We finally got it. Y'all know when I, I got, I love when I got black men on here to talk and tell our story because everyone else is trying to create a narrative for us. So when we can tell our own narrative, I love to have it. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. I know you as Uncle Kev. So you introduce yourself yeah. and let the people know who you are and about what you do. All right. Well, my name is Kevin Go. I go by Uncle Kev. Um, my brand name is Uncle Kev. Uh, by day, I'm an educator, currently a partnership director for Building 21 High School. I used to teach. I've uh, been in education for the last 11 years now. Yeah, 11 years. Wow. I've done everything between teaching kindergarten, second grade, post-secondary counseling, high school, um, SAT prep English. Now I provide opportunities for students to see themselves in, in external spaces and still learn. Um, aside from that, I run a nonprofit organization called All the Kings Men. It's community outreach and mentorship for young black and brown boys, ages 10 to 18. Uh, we focus on academic success, behavioral support in classrooms, um, overall school attendance and things of that nature currently operating in three schools and two potential schools before the end of the year I'm trying to lock in. So out here just trying to maximize my my gifts that God gave me and use them for the betterment of the world, man. That's it. Wow, man. You doing a lot, man. I got I gotta I gotta catch up. You inspire, man. You inspire <laughs> lot, man. Oh man. Um first off I wanna say uh congrats. Um because I know you just had a beautiful daughter, right? Yeah. Um, how was that experience? How was the transition like as being a black father? Because you know we got that narrative on us that we don't want to take care of our kids. But when I watch you, you in, is in love with your baby girl. Man, so talk I could, about that experience, man. Man, the crazy thing is, is she'll be four months in a week. Mm -hmm. And in four months' time, it's hard to imagine life without this little girl. Mm -hmm. like, I think the moment I learned about her, to be completely honest, um, I was unsure. Like, mm. I was the type of person, well, I'm still the type of person that, that like, I want to make sure, well, I always feel like I have to have everything figured out. Mm. Um, but fatherhood is one of those things you just got to go through day by day. Mm -hmm. It ain't nothing written to, nope. to tell you how to be uh, a great father, what happens when this happens and all that other stuff. And I've done so much work with boys over the years that, um, I figured that, you know, having a kid, God just gonna automatically make him, but I'm automatically too to take that to me. He was like, nah, bro, <laughs> for this little girl, slow you down a little bit, teach you so much about yourself, man. And I like, it's, it's humbling, it's grateful. Like, I ain't gonna lie, I miss sleep, I miss sleep, I miss sleep. <laughs> but, um, I wouldn't trade it for the world, bro. Mm -hmm. I would not trade it for the world. This little girl in a short amount of time has given me so much more to live for. And it's a blessing. It's a true blessing, man. Man, that's that's exciting to hear, man. Like I, I got my boys, my two boys, and mm -hmm. um, you know, people think like it's this amazing thing, like it's a magic trick when you see a black father taking the care of their kids, and it's like like it's not supposed to happen. It's not supposed it's this is normal, like it, it's yeah. normal. But I understand because from the where we come from, it's like a lot of the narratives get like placed on us. So with you uh, being able to be a father yourself, and now you see these young men that you deal with on a day to day basis. Yeah. What do you think? I know the answer, or what I think is the answer. But what do you think is missing from them that 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 that, that they need and they're looking for that causes them to act out or be around bunches because i'm gonna get my answer up front i think it's a lot of daddies missing once, once the oh. daddy's there that's it bro you took it right out I, like they they're missing the same thing i was missing when i was their age genuine love and care from the people who we wanted from the most our parents hmm. um i didn't have my father around um and at some point i decided to let that be what wrote my narrative. I let that be what helped me decide who I needed to be. And then when I realized that I can't use that as an excuse, that I didn't necessarily need my father's presence to be what gave me permission to do and be great. Mm. I, you know, just went on that way. I was like, listen, there's nothing 
there's nothing his presence or his absence could do to take me out of who God designed me to be anyway. So mm. I just may, I may as well be who I need to be. And uh, no lie, sometimes it was tough. I hated my pop. I love my pop, but I'm the only person alive in this world that can get my pop to listen. Mm-hmm. So that's just what that is. So I think like, they are missing exactly what I was missing. That mm-hmm. that genuine love and guidance from the people we wanted from the most. And and what well, strangely enough is that they're gonna find it wherever they choose to find it. Good and or bad. That's why I do what I do, bro. Right. Like let me be that that intervention before you go look for it in a place that's not gonna comfort you. Not right. gonna show you what you need to be, how to utilize your, your gifts for something good. Um I can't even I can't even say it's the streets, man. Like these guys legit just look for somebody to show them something different. That's it. Um, they're used to the narratives the streets are writing, the things that the streets is introducing to them. What they're not used to is somebody loving and caring for them genuinely. So when you show that, they're they're a little standoffish at at first. At, at, at first, but then when they realize that you mean business, they give you what you want and they get what they need out of out of it. So that's what that is, bro. Like. They just need exactly what you said, bro. We we need we need men to step up. Let's mm-hmm. just I'm just put it out there, uh, and women too. But there's nothing more essential to the development of a, the mental state of a young boy than that of the presence of a man, be it his father, his uncle, his grandpa, a community leader, a male teacher, whoever it is. He needs that that male figure to kind of guide him in a different direction all i had was women around me so i learned how to be a, a man based upon how they interacted with the men in their lives like my dad wasn't around so my mom had boyfriends and stuff like that and i know what i didn't like so i know i didn't want to be him and then when my sister started talking to guys i know what made them cry so i know what not to say to girls to make them cry you know what i'm saying now that i got a daughter i get the chance to be the example my father wasn't to my do- my sisters you know what i'm saying so Everything about the men she fought for lies based upon who I raised her to be as a as a woman. So, yeah, man, I could go on for days about <laughs> that. But <laughs> no, because I we 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 kind of got the same trajectory where my dad we 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 be rebuilt our relationship or we're working on. It. I don't even say it's rebuilt, but um, my my mom and my sister was the main main two prominent figures my mom had husbands two husbands which was my dad and my stepdad my stepdad and her wasn't together I had my older sister I watched dudes make her cry watch her go through these things so I knew how to be more gentle with women but I also didn't have the guidance to be in a relationship now because I never seen saw what it looked like so now I'm just trying to figure it out I had my fumbles I messed up uh, mm-hmm. Fortunately enough, I'm still with the woman that I had both of my children by, and we were able to work through our differences. But it wouldn't have been it would have been a lot of help just having that guidance, like you said. Oh yeah. And, and the only thing that I had for me, because mind you, I got two kids, and my friends, majority of my friends, straight, straight out of college, we don't they don't got no kids. So now I'm alone in this journey trying to figure this yeah. out, and then I'm yeah. a fumble, and then they gonna learn from me. So yeah. I still got to mess up. <laughs> Yeah, most of my close male friends are married, but mm-hmm. I'm the only one out of my circle with, with a kid. So okay. it's like we kind of balance each other out a little bit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, like, I want to touch on something you said about, you know, basically what you needed and stuff like that. And you said you, you didn't want to fail. Sometimes we need to. Mm-hmm. Like, um, that gives us permission to kind of like look at life from a different perspective. Like, we can't always be the best at everything and mm. nobody's going to teach us to do that um and the best thing my father could have did for me was not be there because mm. had he been there in the state that he was in it'll ru- it would have ruined me mm. so that's the best gift i could have ever received from my father was his absence you know that's the title of this episode now right <laughs> i only try to figure out what quote was said that's the title of it, it would have been right there <laughs> But um, you say y'all have some type of relationship now. Yeah. Uh, how did that like happen? Um, cause for me, I know I had to do some reaching out. Like I had to put aside. I always say you either fight for the relationship or you fight for 
your childhood. You ain't a child yeah. no more, so you can't get that back. Yeah. But I started fighting for the relationship. And once I started growing through my own manly things, I was like, this dude wasn't capable of doing it. Like he yeah. had, he didn't even have the tools necessary to take care of me. So I understood yeah. it. It doesn't make it right, but I understood it. So talk more about your experience with that. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by the Verisot Co. The Verisots offers the most unique and stylish products on the market. They provide products that are bold, adventurous, and express confidence. Their products are meant to draw attention and stand out from the norm. They are creative socks for those who aspire to stand out. They are a combination of comfort and expression for the modern individual. The Verisot Co. is a transcendent accessory line retailer offering unique designs that can be worn on any occasion. Whether you're dressing for a boardroom or the boardwalk, they have a design for you. The founder is actually my, co- my, my college roommate, Jabril Hart. I can vouch that you're getting quality products and excellent service um, from just spending time with him and knowing the type of guy he is. He was also on episode three of the Black Mental Health Podcast, so go check that out um, to hear more of his story and what he has going on. For more information about Jabril Hart, or Co. check out DeVerisocko.com. Sorry, it was so many code socks, whatever, but check them out, I, um, and I can vouch for them. Tell them where I sent you. This portion of the podcast is also brought to you by the BYOB Retreat. BYOB stands for Building Your Own Business. BYOB is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, side hustlers, and creators of color. In its second year, the BYOB retreat continues to bring together some of the country's most dynamic entrepreneurs, strategists, creatives, and minds for for sessions around building your business, scaling your impact, and managing your money, and learning to live your best life holistically. They connect the most talent and diverse brands in a culturally inclusive space to help you grow from startup to success. It's more than an event. More than a conference, more than just feelings. It's about leaving your old self behind and returning with new vision, new skills, and new connection for life. Get ready to join over 2,000 plus digital entrepreneurs, modern creatives, and diverse innovative leaders May 24th through 26th only at BYOB Retreat in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information about the BYOB Retreat, check out BYOBLive.com and tell them Red sent you. So I was an after school instructor at Lee in elementary in West Philly, mm. 25 years old. Last year, co- no, I was finished college. Yeah, fresh out of college. First job was an after school job. It had been on my mind since I was 17 years old to write my dad a letter. Mind you, I said I was 25, right? Right. Since I was 17. Wow. Every day I thought about writing my dad a letter. And every time I thought about it, I was like, nah, I'm cool. One day I was just like, you know what? Forget it. Mm-hmm. I wrote my dad a letter on a Friday. Four and a half pages front and back. Wow. In this letter, I said everything I felt like I needed to say. Poured my mm-hmm. heart out. I was mad in the letter. I cursed in the letter. Mm-hmm. I was sad in the letter. I cried in the letter. Like, all parts of me. And my my little boy self who yearned for a relationship with his father was poured out in that letter. I put it in the mailbox on a Friday, immediately regretted it. I'm like, how are you going to respond? Like, right. if he called, like I started going through scenarios. If he called me, if he could get the letter and curse me out, then I'm going to curse him out. Right. And then he's just going to have to fight me when he see me. Right. And, but if he get the letter and he'd be remorseful, like, what am I going to do with that? Because I don't know how to deal with this man's emotions. I don't even, you know what I'm saying? So, right, right. I remember clear as day on a Tuesday afternoon, I met at the school program and I had two of my sons with me. That's what I called the guys that I mentored. Two of my sons were with me, bro. And I got a call from a number that I didn't know. It was my pop. And I was like, hello. And basically, long story short, he couldn't even talk. He was crying. Mm. He was like, I got your letter. And I took this deep breath because in that moment, I'm going back to that that scenario play I put in my head. Like, all right, he told me he got the letter. Uh, is he about to curse me out? Is he about to do this and do that? Because I was playing back. All right, if he come if he come ugly, I'm coming ugly. At this point, I ain't got nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. And his man was like, yo, I always wanted to be your father. I just never knew how. Woo. I'm 40 years old. I can't even call myself a man. And then what he said next really stuck with me. He was like, Teach me how to be the father you always wanted. Mm. And I lost it, bro. I lost it. And from that point forward, I knew he was willing. 
even if he didn't try hard, I knew he was willing. And that that's when I started to understand, like, I can't expect him to be, and my 25-year-old self can't expect him to be who I wanted and needed him to be at six and seven years old and growing up. So I have to look at him differently. I have to give him a chance at this point. Uh, I'm 32 years old now. Uh, we don't have the best relationship, but I get excited when he calls me. And, and and that's off the strength of how can this relationship go? My dad had had and probably still has, like if you let me say it, uh, still has an issue with alcohol. Um, probably other drugs but uh i'll leave i'll leave that alone <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. uh but yeah and like i said i'm the only person alive in this world that my dad will listen to like with no strings attached just mm -hmm. listen and i use that to my advantage because <laughs> like prior to having my like my daughter would be four months i probably heard from her once since she was born mm -hmm. and um when he calls me sometimes he's intoxicated and i'm not interested Mm -hmm. So I get the ball is in my court now. Right? Yeah. I, 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 I've made it so that I don't have to rely on you to figure out how well I should be in a relationship with my father. Like mm -hmm. I get to choose how I allow myself to show up in that relationship. Mm -hmm. So if I choose to remove myself, then that's what I got to do for me. But I say all that to say I was able to get how I felt out. Um, he was able to hear it, feel it, and do what he chose to do with it. And I made my peace with that, and I made my peace with God, and that's all I owe myself. And notice I said myself, I that's never it. owed him anything. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what that is, man. No, nah, man, that's, that is, man, that is phenomenal. Because it, it, it's crazy because we walk <laughs> past, but it's the same narrative, almost in the sense of, like, I had the same struggle with my father. And still to this day, the relationship is not where I would like it to be. And then yeah. you find yourself almost like I'm teaching you and it's yeah. like my dad, but yeah. you kind of just got to take it for what it is. And it's like, as long as I have that open line of communication, I allow the type of pain that you make me feel mm -hmm. or the type of uh, happiness you give me. Yep. Like yourself, I went through, when I went through my accident, I was happy as hell. I cried when my dad walked through the door because I was sitting there complaining to my mother, my God, my, my sisters, all these women in the room. I'm like, well, where's the, the testosterone at? Like, where is the man at? And, <laughs> and he just wasn't there. And, and then I went to sleep. I guess yeah. I was mad upset. I, walked, I woke up, and he was walking through the door. I bawled my little eyes out. Because it's like, as much yeah. as grown as you are, you still yearn from that attention from your father. Man, or a male figure, listen, period. You sound like me. I, was graduate, I graduated from Temple in 2010, right? Mm. My dad had been planning a whole year prior to my graduation about him coming. He had told me, look. I know the date, I took off, the boom, 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 boom. Two months before graduation, my dad told me he wasn't coming. Instead of me saying, you know, to myself, you know, all right, whatever, uh, you can't make it, you can't make it. I was a little boy in that moment. Mm. Here you go, not showing up for me again. Bro. So the entire day of graduation, everybody I ever cared for was there to support me. And I'm looking around and 8,000 people around me for like my graduate wise, but I'm looking in the Leah Core Center and there's thousands of people in here. And I look at one corner and I see my pop standing there. Mm. I was like, yo, nothing else mattered. Like mm. my grandma is my world. She was dead, but I saw my dad and I was like, dang, like you missed every monumental part of my life. Mm -hmm. But the last chapter you was here for, mm -hmm. I was like, yo, that, that's something. Like, I was excited. I was happy. Nothing mattered to me more in that moment than to see him there to support me. And I told him when he came in, I'm like, you, and he stayed. He stayed as long as he could. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was in the hospital for a week. He stayed for at least for half, more, if not more. And he spent every night in there. And I'm like, yo, you gained some years back, man. I got to give you that up. credit. Yeah. I got to. You you came yeah. at a pivotal point, a point and you gained mm -hmm. some years back, man. At least some of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what's up man that's a blessing <laughs> that's a blessing so um i don't want to get I, I guess i can get into it now but you posted a story um and it, on fa on facebook or instagram i don't remember you probably on both and you posted a story um i don't want to uh miss tell it 
So I'll let you tell it from your point of view, but it, it just enraged me and it and it ties into mental health in the black community because it's still external things that we cannot control that we have to deal with. But I, again, I don't want to over talk it. I'll let you take it away. So basically we were in uh we were in Delaware and um we had a light in this, you know. My girl and her best friend are in the front, and then it's me, my daughter, and her best friend's son in the back. And he, her son, was saying, like, like, "Why he? Why is he looking at me? Or why is he looking at me? What is he saying to me?" And her tents are like dumb dark, so I'm like, "Roll the window down so we can see what's up. It could be something wrong in my brain." I'm like, "Okay, what's up?" So I see the guy lean out of his window. The, a white guy leaning out of his window and just saying the spewing all this negative energy, right? Wow. So I'm at this point, I'm getting mad, not even knowing what he's saying. So I'm like, roll the window down, roll the window down, roll the window down. She finally cracks the window. She was scary. But she finally cracked the window. <laughs> and I go, um, and I hear him and he says, uh, do you effing hear me? Um he spits at the car and called us effing niggers. Mm. And at this point, I could care less about anything else other than the rage I was feeling. Like, I just wanted to follow him. I just wanted to follow him. And I wanted, when I followed him, whatever happened, happened at that point. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, that's what I wanted to happen. But reality of the situation, thank God, you know, my girl was like, no, anything could happen. Mm -hmm. Our daughter's in the car. This and that. Like, bro. I was so enraged, I couldn't stop shaking. I was yeah. so mad. Because I think for me, what it was, was like, how can somebody blatantly disrespect somebody like that? Yeah, like, even when you're mad at somebody, the worst, like, what's worse than physically hitting somebody is spitting on them. Mm -hmm. He spit at the, that makes you feel like you're worthless. And then, not only to spit, but then to say effing niggas. And I'm like, yo. Right. Th this still happens. Right. Like, this still, and that was the first time I had experienced that level of extreme racism. Like I have been racially profiled plenty of times before. Um, but never to that extent. And for me in that moment, aside from rage, I just couldn't understand why. Like mm. we never did anything. We just mm. had a light just like y'all at the light. And we deserve that. Okay. Right. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow, man. So you you spoke on something and it instantly made me think of something um, because I, I know I had it in myself, that black boy rage where oh, yeah. we, we carrying around uh, that not having our fathers. We carrying around mm -hmm. men ain't ish. We carrying around men ain't no fathers. Like we, we yeah. carrying around all of this stuff. Um, how do you uh, manage it within yourself and how do you teach the boys that you work with to manage it? So for me, honestly, I have never been a confrontational person. Mm. The only time I ever like got angry enough to argue with somebody is if I was super mad and couldn't control it. Mm. Like if I allowed myself to get super mad, but I've never been confrontational. So I, somebody had to take me there in order mm. for me to res get that kind of response out of me, right? Mm. That has been my entire life. Like I'm 32 years old. I probably had two fights my entire life. Because mm. I don't like confrontation. I've had plenty of arguments, but mm. I never allow myself to get that mad. Um, so in situations like that, um, I think for me, I always reflect on the image I portray to other people. And I'm like, I have a following. And these young bulls, like, I am the only source of positive energy or positive interaction that they see. And if I respond in this way that gives them permission to do the same mm. so i can't do that so i'm always self-checking myself and self-checking myself just to make sure you know at the end of the day somebody's watching you and you don't want you don't want them to feel like what you how you respond gives them the green light to do the same so when i say to my guys like i tell them listen i'm human you're going to see me do something i'm not supposed to do you're going to hear me say something i wouldn't necessarily say check me on it mm because I'm gonna check you on it. So I give them I give them complete permission to be like, yo, Kev, you tripping. Like, yo, Kev, you bugging, that ain't you. You don't talk like that. I remember the first time I cursed him on one of my boys, he was like, yo, I ain't even know you talk like that. Don't do that again. <laughs> I was like, you right, you mm. right, because that's not me, I don't do that. Mm. Um, and then 
Like it's just it's just constant checking. Like I don't expect them to give me anything that I wouldn't give to them. So it's like just as much as I'm their mentor, they let me know that yo, we your little brothers too. So if you do something out of whack, we checking you on it. Right. Yo, Kev, you're not about to argue with this kid. Right. You're not about to argue with this this parent. You're not about to do this. You're not about to do that. That's not you. That's not you. So I don't I don't really have to to answer your question, I don't really have to say much to the guys. They already know what's up. Right. Like, um, at any moment I catch them slipping. It's just a simple look. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. It's a look. <laughs> Come on, man. Like, you know what's up. You know yeah. better than that. Like, and I've been blessed to have been able to operate with young guys who have parents who give me permission to be that hardcore mentor. Mm. Like, it's been mom saying, if you need to put your hands on them, put your hands on them. Because if you don't, it's in the street going to, and it's not right. just going to be hands. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, I haven't met too many fathers, bro. And I mentor over 60 guys in the city. And mm. I've only met maybe two fathers. Everybody else is single moms. And it's like, yo, Kev, we need you because they don't get it at anywhere else. Mm. So it's like, yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a checks and balances type thing. Just as much as I'm a mentor who's mentoring, um, my mentees kind of give me the same thing I give them. And the beauty in it all is that I see them beginning to mentor young boys mm. the same way I do for them. And like, man, you talk about something that makes you feel good, that's it. Mm. That's it. To hear somebody was like, one of my boys was asked what he want to do for his senior project. Um, I want to do the impact of mentorship on black and brown boys. And I want Mr. Cab to be my mentor for the senior project. He's already my personal mentor, but I want to shadow him. I want to follow him to see what it is that he do. Wow. So that I can do the best I can at this. And he currently mentors five ninth grade boys. Just wow. about the strength of relationship, man. The best feeling in the world. Best feeling in the world. So wow. yeah, I don't really have to I don't really have to say much to them about, you know, responding to things negatively. They just think, hey, how would Kev do it? Mm. and that's how I think like if I do this and if I say this and I respond to this in this way what does that say to them and then I, I just check myself um you spoke on something that I wanted to I know you spoke on it briefly but I was going to ask um what do you do with the parents who boys are out of control but you know how some people don't want you everybody talking to their kids any type of way or talking to them or this oh, yeah. well how do you handle oh, yeah. that situation this part of the podcast is brought to you by You Stress Inc. We all have good days and bad days, but some may need help to make sure they that their good ones outweigh the bad. You Stress Inc. strives to raise awareness around a taboo topic that one may suffer along with on with on a day to day basis. You Stress Inc. is a non profit organization whose mission is to raise awareness on the importance of mental health in underserved communities. On Saturday, May 18th, You Stress Inc. is presenting Charlotte's fourth annual Let's Talk About It Mental Health Awareness Walk. The Let's Talk About It Walk will be held at Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School in Charlotte, North Carolina. They ultimately, they ultimately want to show support for those in the community living with mental disorders and, and to encourage everyone not to be afraid to talk about it. You Stress Inc. was founded by Rashawn Miller, who is a mental health change agent and one of my many inspirations in my mental health journey. For more information about anything else with You Stress Inc. and what Rashawn has going on, check out YouStressInc.org um, and tell them rest in you. This part of the podcast is also brought to you by No Black Girl Left Behind. No Black Girl Left Behind is a movement that cultivates a safe space for the black women for black women to come together to connect, uplift, and inspire one another towards fulfilling their endeavors. It's an opportunity for black women to unite and provide one another with support and respect. It's a place to promote leadership amongst black women in the community. It's a home for black women to connect with other organizations to achieve mutual goals, and they take pride in mentoring and breeding leadership in the younger generation, with one of its main goals being to promote awareness of black culture. One of the founders was on episode 11 of the Black Mental Health Podcast. So make sure you check it out and to hear more of her story 
and what she has going on. For more information about Dr. Alexis Rhodes or the No Left, the No Girl Left Behind movement, check out No Black No Black Girl Left Behind dot com and tell them Red sent you. I, I'm straightforward with parents. I'd be like, listen, I came at your son because this scenario played out two ways for me. Like, <clears throat> in all of my professional self, <clears throat> I just did you a service. Mm. Because your son go outside and he talk to somebody outside like that, you may not get him home tonight, mom. So, anymore, like, most of the time, I have moms call me. And say, yo, Kev, come check your boy before I hurt him. Mm-hmm. Or he decided to come in the house and he did this and that. And I just, you know, drives, pick him up. We go for a ride. It ain't an easy ride. They hate yeah. me. But by the time they re- return home, they know what they need to do. Right. And I just think, like, parents just need to know, like, a lot of these parents are, are actually looking for the village that used to exist. Mm. It ain't like they don't want people to, you know, reprimand their sons. They just want the right people doing it. Mm. So it's like, where's the trust? Who do we trust? Um, because think about it. Most of these moms are single mothers. The fathers of their children are supposed to be the ones doing all that. So mm. if the person you entrusted to sleep with mm. backed out on his responsibility for his son, who do you trust? What other mm. man do you trust with him? So you got to kind of show yourself worthy enough to be trusted by these mothers, man, because I, I can honestly say um, that if anything was to happen to any of their moms, their moms already know that I got them. Right. You know, so um, but that takes work, and it takes them believing in your methods, and you can't be apologetic when doing that, bro, and I don't, I don't have no, listen, <laughs> I remember I had to grip up one of my fourth grade students when I taught fourth grade. he go home and tell his mom. Mom called me. I said, Mom, your son threw a chair at me today, Mom. And I needed to keep my job. So um, I didn't throw the chair back, but I definitely gripped him up and told him, don't ever try me like that again. But he said, Mr. Kev came, put his hands on. I said, no, I never put my hands on him. I gripped that shirt up, though. Mm. And I launched him across the room and told him, don't ever try me like that again. I said, because, Mom, I'm a man first. Mm -hmm. And I love your son. I want to teach him, but I can't if he's going to challenge me as a man. Mm. And she was like, you are so right. Thank you for doing that. And anytime he gives you any trouble, you have my permission to do what you need to do to make sure he's cool. And then come to find out she's been struggling with him at home all along. Mm. So I'm like, yo, is it like, and that goes back to what we originally started saying, bro. Like people need these men need to step up, man. Like we got too many positive figures in the wrong spaces. Oof. It's too many, too many, dudes in the streets willing to permit our boys to be street dudes mm. because they was lost and nobody found them or nobody chose to find them mm-hmm. or they chose to be lost and hidden so that they couldn't be found because I think it's fair game for everybody mm-hmm. I think everybody has the opportunity to find that one person to save them or to save themselves and some people choose not to it's easier to be lost you don't have to deal with the deep rooted issues when you're lost. Mm-hmm. You don't have to talk about what hurts you when you're lost. You get to cover that up with with ridicule, with curse words, with drugs, with alcohol, with with violence. You cover all that up, and then at the end of the day, when when the streets leave you hanging, you still got all that in here. Mm-hmm. All you needed to do was have one conversation. That's it. All Change you needed everything. to do was say, "Look, I'm hurt. Look, I'm broken." That's all that is. Man, um, uh, I want I don't want to hold you too much, so I, I got like two, three more questions. Um, you good, bro? <laughs> um, relationships. We mm-hmm. talked about the mom and the dad not being there. How are you able to make your relationship work with it? I'm I'm assuming that's the mother of your child, correct? Uh oh. Oh yeah, yeah. Did it break up? I can't uh, hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Oh, yeah. Saying, it's the mother of your child, correct? Yeah. All right. Um, How were you able to make that last? Because like you said, we're two broken people coming yeah. together. And now we broken and we're trying to make a broken relationship work. And it, it's impossible. So now we got to wind up doing some healing alongside of building our relationship at the same time. 
tell your experience with that, your story, everything. <laughs> and that's what you do when people spit in bars and you ain't got the words. Because it's poetry, bro. <laughs> How has your experience been with that? Listen to me. I am one of the most honest people with myself. Person, mm. like I'm, I'm most honest with myself, and I'm, I have no problem saying when something's wrong with me, mm. and I have no problems seeking help in places where I need it. But what I do have a problem with is when I don't get permission from the people I'm supposed to get it from to do that, mm. right? So when it comes to like healing yourself in the midst of a relationship, you have to be forefront and honest with the person you're with, and just be like, listen. I want this to be done for us, but before this can be done for us, I have to do this for me. And I think in in my situation, we're both in the same, we're both on the same totem pole. The only difference is that I am very forefront and honest with the fact that I need help with some of the things that broke me from the past. And I seek after that. I see a therapist every two weeks. And mm. I don't have no shame in that. Right. Um, but I also talk about my problems when they come up. I don't hold it. I can't hold it um, because I'm not, I can't be phony. I can't be fake. I can't look at you and know I got an issue with you and not have discussed that issue and then move past it like it's cute. Like some women like to do, like uh, hug me and that ends our problems. No, we have, we need conversation, boo. Like, <laughs> because the only way this will work. What you say? This could last. What you say? <laughs> <laughs> is that if, if we completely honest with each other, like, so the same work I'm willing to give myself, I'm willing to give you, but me first. And I expect you to, to carry it the same way. The same way you're expecting me to work on me, I'm expecting you to work on you. And I want you to do that for yourself first. Whether or not at the end of that work we're together, I know you'll be some good because you did the work for yourself. And I, I, I had that conversation with her all the time. What if we don't let? Mm. What does that mean? What does that look like now that we have a daughter? I want us to be able to understand that in all of it, we've done so much healing for ourselves that we've healed under the impression that my healing may not be a safe space for you. Because mm. we fell in love with mess. We were Ooh. broken. I felt like my missing puzzle piece rest ruled and abides somewhere in your stuff. Mm. And I look for it somewhere in your stuff. But when you begin to heal and that piece was never there from the jump, what am I missing now? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I have to be comfortable in the fact that your healing may not be my safe space. Mm. Your healing may be your permission slip to do you. And by all means, do that. Because then that says to me, there's so much more healing I need to do so that I don't even look for that peace in nobody else but myself. You that are puts preaching. me in a place where I got to be one-on-one -on -one with God. And that's that's the that's what it is, bro. That's what it is. So when you talk about relationship and you talk about how do y'all balance each other, you gotta be completely honest, bro. Like I'm broken, I'm hurting, I'm messed up over some stuff. Some of it has nothing to do with you. So I apologize when I was angry with you two weeks ago and I said this thing that had nothing to do with you. That was a daddy issue creeping up in there somewhere. But let's be honest, you got daddy issues too. Mine just look different for yours because I'm a man and you're a woman. I can't be your pop and your boyfriend too. You choose who Ooh. you need. Because I can only show up in one area. So that's, that's what that is. And, and I think the beauty in knowing that is that the fact that I'm dealing with somebody who's completely understanding of that. So mm -hmm. as I heal and as she heals, we may heal separately. And if that happens then that's the way the story is written. Mm -hmm. But best believe our daughter won't know a difference between how her parents show up for her. Man, <laughs> you, you hit so many points, man. Uh, <laughs> so many things, man. And it's, 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 you so right with all of that stuff, man. And I try to, I, the, the best analogy me and my fiance came up with is, we all in the same traffic. We in two different cars. We trying to go the same way, but we may go in different spe speeds. Mm -hmm. or if we mm -hmm. still trying to go the same way, we should meet. We yeah, should somewhere. meet. But if we don't, it's okay. Because you're right. You <laughs> and I'm running my race. 
and I'm driving Absolutely. my way and you driving your way. But it, like, Absolutely. It, it makes sense right now, but it may not yep. always make sense. So when people yep. are like, when y'all get married and when y'all doing that, it's like, when we ready, when, we, when it's our time. Yo. <laughs> my time, not yours, boo. Right. Because at the end of the day, I can't get married to please you. Right. Because you ain't got to live in my household. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and people be like, y'all done had a kid. Now when is the mm-hmm. wedding? When when we decide to have one, mm-hmm. if we ever get there. Exactly. We got too many issues that hash out. Sometimes stuff happens. Sometimes stuff don't go by law, by the mm-hmm. book. And and when it don't go by the book, you got to learn how to turn the pages. Of few. Like, you ever, you ever went to take a test and you get to see the passage and you get to see the answers at the same time? Mm-hmm. But you understand in order to answer the question correctly, you got to either read the passage first mm-hmm. or go back to the passage and look for the hints that are, are given already in the mm-hmm. answer. Relationships the same way. Mm. It's the same way. Look, I, I get to see what I want and what I have right here. But at some point when it's time for me to answer to myself or to answer to her, I don't get the opportunity to go back and reread. Mm-hmm. I have to skim through, pull out the pieces. Yep. Pull out the pieces. And sometimes people don't know how to do that. Critical thinking skills applies to more than just the books. Mm. Mm. You, you gotta you gotta learn how to mastermind and maneuver thought in every single space of your life. And and sometimes it ain't always easy when you're dealing with women who <laughs> tread lightly, tread lightly. Tread yeah, I'm, yeah, let me go ahead and shout out. But no, <laughs> it ain't always easy. I'll just say that. It's not always it's easy. It's not always but easy. <laughs> it, it, it serves a purpose. And like mm-hmm. I said, whether or not y'all heal in the same space or you heal separately, healing must occur. Mm-hmm. And and those conversations must happen. Um, last question. Um, what is your overall viewpoint, perspective, experience with mental health in the black community, especially with the young black boys? Um, I always say when I go speak at schools and talk to the kids, I'm like, we all shouldn't feel alone in a room full of people. Like we all feeling alone, and we all going through our own internal struggles. But we sitting here acting like we all ain't got the same problems. Oh, so, my. <laughs> so what is your viewpoint on mental health? Whatever you want, just go. Fire, whatever comes to mind, go ahead. So, Pete, I never knew mental health had a name. Mm-hmm. I never knew I suffered traumatic experiences. Mm-hmm. I never knew my experience could be placed under the umbrella of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um. So when I was introduced to the idea that I had, in fact, suffered traumatic experiences, I had to do some self-reflection. And here's what that is. There is no way I can be 100% great at what I do and be 100% broken in who I am. Mm. So at some point, I had to understand the process of healing supports the process of progression in my areas of greatness, no matter where I decide to show up in life. I can't be a a great educator and be broken. I can't be a great mentor and be broken. Can't be a great father, boyfriend, cousin, friend, brother, uncle, however, whoever, broken. Um, Mental health is so important to me that I'm willing to risk spending time alone in a world by myself, if that means I get to heal completely and then God just placed me where he thinks I need to be, right? This this goes off like the strength that we don't talk about it enough. We don't heal because we don't talk about it enough. Um, we have to understand that before we owe anybody anything, we owe it to ourselves to be honest. And there's nothing wrong with saying I'm broken and I need help. There's nothing wrong to say I'm hurting and I need healing. The same way you would cut yourself and seek a Band-Aid, well, open wounds always are, 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 are the playground for everything to infest in it. And, and if we're not willing to heal those wounds, we, we are, we're infected. And that's, what that, that's exactly what that is. When you're broken, you're allowing yourself to be infected with so many different things that can cause you to, to, to break down and, uh, and ultimately ruin you. So heal. Point blank period, heal. And 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 to to the young boys out there, stop thinking that 
you diminish your manhood by saying you're hurting. Mm. Stop thinking that you're less of a man because you're hurting. You're more of a man by admitting that you are because admitting it means that you're in a position to accept what comes after it, which is healing. Mm. And change occurs when we're most honest about the things that are hurting us. Hurt people hurt people. We're broken crayon still color. So it's like I'm still able to be hurt and be broken and still be my most beautiful self inside and out while I while I heal. The same way you could rip a dollar taping and still spend it. The same way you could break a crayon and still create a masterpiece on a piece of paper. The same way you break the point of a pencil and can sharpen it and still get the same lead to write the same page, whatever you was going to write with the same pencil is the same way you can take your broken self, put them pieces back together, and do for the world what God intended you to do. And that's create, produce greatness. That's all. And the only way to do that is to accept the fact that I'm not all good, and I won't always be at my best. But in those times that I'm not, trust and believe that I'm going to seek after the help I need to make sure that I get better in this thing. And, and Black men don't talk about it enough. I can't hurt my brother and say that I love him. Mm. But I also can't help hurt myself and accept love from other people. I've missed out on a lot of relationships because I was so broken I wouldn't allow somebody to love me. Mm. Man. So, <laughs> that's where we go with that, bro. <laughs> Heal. Period. Listen, man, I thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for having me. Bro. You got my 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 humblest, like, uh, gracious, like, yo, if you ever need anything, you, you said you got 60 boys. If you need me to take a few off of your hand, I'm here to support. <laughs> I'm here to help. I'm here yeah, to, like, serve, that, like, man. whatever I can do, especially we'll talk uh, more about it later. But I'm here for it um, because, like you said, more positive people got to be in positions to, you know, you're not dressed in a certain manner where they're not going to listen to you. You look like them. You come from them. Like, you you yeah. are them. So they can relate. Yeah. To like, I even see you on there talking. You busting on them. Busting. And going back. Oh, yeah. I get, I get down with them, bro. I get down <laughs> with them. Look, I, I be sweaty. I come home because I done hem some kids up against the lockers. And stuff. Oh, yeah. I get, I get to them. But at the end of the day, I get their respect. And that's what mm -hmm. matters most. That's so true. So you got me. If you need me, um, again, thank it, you. For coming on um and on that note guys follow him he, he I'll, I'll i'll put his link his information on the show notes um follow him support him support his nonprofit. um everything that you got going on um and remember that this platform has never been about an alter uh, uh replacing therapy it's an alternative and it's a place where people share therapeutic stories thank you for listening